Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the great Teddy Atlas. Today's episode is brought to you by Teddy's audiobook, Atlas, From the Streets to the Ring, A Son's Journey to Become a Man. Be sure to check this one out. Teddy does the reading, and the book includes exclusive conversations with Teddy between chapters. The book's available on iTunes and Audible. Excellent read if you haven't already read it. Teddy, good to be with you. Happy Welcome New back. Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. It's, uh, we missed you. I don't know if you missed us, but I hope you did. But we missed you. It's good to be back, and congratulations right away. You didn't waste no time. The new year, you won a big race, a huge race, over 8,000 entrants in there. Congratulations. Tell me about it a little bit. Uh, Pasadena Half Marathon this past Sunday, yep. I won. Very lucky, very fortunate. <laughs> KTLA was and there. What's luck got to do it? <clears throat> okay, I know you're trying to be humble and all that stuff, but really, what's luck got to do with hard work? And, uh, you know, putting yourself out there, taking a chance, you know, uh, whether you win or lose, you're putting yourself out there to find out what you can do. That's the big part of it, honestly, put, putting yourself out there. The motivation to not embarrass myself is far greater than the drive to win. I just put myself in those positions and it's like an accountability exercise to say, all right, let's do this. I, I don't want to be here, but it's, you know, almost like a fight, like. People who say they're not afraid at a fight, they're they're lying, right? Everyone has a fear, whatever that fear may Go be. Go to a doctor, find out what's wrong <laughs> with you if you're not afraid. Yeah, so KTLA was there doing the interview afterwards, the local news, and the woman said, you won the race, and I couldn't help but to say, uh, oh, doesn't really say much about the competition. <laughs> and that got a good laugh from her. And uh, no, you know, it's uh, winning a race to me is like, not as good as winning a world title in boxing, but at this age, it's the closest I'm going to get, and it's a huge motivating factor. It was fun to win, and I appreciate all the kind words that people sent. It was a um, nice reward for all the hard work. You know how much running I do when I'm... We have in questions the, in life about ourselves. It's good to get some answers, right? Yeah. Right? To yeah. get the, that, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, I could. You know, I'm sure there's a moment when you're... When you're giving in a little bit, right? Yeah. Submission, that, that word is out there. It hangs above us like clouds. <laughs> uh, you know, the thought of submission. Do we or don't we? To what degree do we? Yeah. You know? And um, so that's that's a checkpoint for you. Very uh, much. And you can use it in other things in your life. Yeah. You know? And that's why I'm saying it, for people to hear that. And for me, for the new year, no races. <laughs> uh, I, the only thing I can report is that I finally got a good winter coat. My daughter bought me for Christmas a real winter coat. It's yeah, the I never, first thing I, I noticed. I, I know you noticed it right <laughs> away. I, I never had a I never had a good winter coat. I, <laughs> I always would go out like this, you know, uh, with a sweatshirt or with a sweatsuit. My father was the same way. My father, doctor, all those years, you know. Uh, in and out, going to the projects, going to the house calls, in and out of the car. The cold, back in the day when there were real cold winters. I mean, real cold, <laughs> real cold. He <laughs> never wore a coat. And um, one glove, he would lose his gloves. He had one glove. <laughs> he put the glove on that, that he was carrying the doctor bag with, you know, and, 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 until he lost that. But when he would find it again, he'd, he'd warm that glove up again. He'd warm that hand up again. But my daughter, Nicole, boy, uh, she got me a... What a, and 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 the first thing I thought, I hope it gets cold. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not cold enough because it's a real cold. It's you know? cold now. You know, and so I wore it today, and you know, I, I was like, maybe maybe I could walk a little few extra blocks. You know, the walk from the subway. I hope it's a little longer. I saw because, you marching uh, around down there like a peacock with his feathers up. Well, like, no, look at yeah, my new. No, I felt good. You know, I felt warm. You know, yep. I even texted my daughter from the subway. I said thanks for the coat. <laughs> you know, just a little thing, just a little thing like that. Yep, happy. Well, we had a month off, but honestly, it feels it feels like several months. I miss doing this. I miss the fans. I miss talking to you, hearing your input on the, your takes on all the fights. And we had some good ones over the break. Surprisingly, at the end of the year, we had some really good ones and a couple good ones to start the year. So let's jump right in and get to it. We got a lot to cover today. So let's jump in and talk about one at the end of last year, Jamel Charlo and Tony Harrison. Incredible fight. Um... Charlo won, stopped Tony Harrison. I had, probably like you, Harrison winning the fight. Unfortunately, the judges didn't see it that way, but thankfully it didn't come down to a controversial decision because Charlo did stop him. Excellent performance by Charlo to come back and stop him in a fight that, like I said, I thought we, I think we both thought he was losing. But I want to hear your thoughts on that. The scorecards had um, two guys had it. 
Two Judge has had it 96-93 for um, Charlo. I, I don't see it that way. I'd be curious to hear their explanation here. David Sutherland and Lou Moret. And uh, Tim Cheatham had it 95-94 for Harrison, which, all right, I thought he had a bigger lead than that. But nevertheless, like I say, he stopped him late in the fight. And um, love to hear your thoughts on that one. Yeah, look, first of all, the old timers used to say that when you win a title – you automatically improve 30%. Bang. Proof, exhibit A in a courtroom to me. And for you guys out there, I think you really, I want you to look at this at least. It was present, evident with Harrison. He had improved 30%. He was more short and stuff. He was the champ. And he fought like it. And the first time he fought, he, you know, a lot of people said that he didn't win the fight. I went to bat for him. He won that fight against Charlo the first time. That's why they had the rematch. He, he won the fight. He outboxed him. He won that fight. And thank God. I'm always, you know, criticizing the judges here. We, we hold their feet to the fire. Someone's got to do it uh, when, when they're wrong, corrupt, incompetent, whatever the frig it is. But when they're wrong and wrong too often. But when they're right, we, we praise them. I want to make sure we do that. And I praised those judges when they got it right in the first fight with Charlo and Harrison, and they gave it to Harrison. And here's the rematch. The first time, as I said, Harrison outboxed him. This time, the confidence, the 30% improvement for Harrison. And it showed. And it showed in a way where it buoyed him so much that... He forgot that he wasn't a more physical, stronger guy. You know, because Charlo, that's one advantage he had. The bigger guy, the stronger guy, whatever you want to call it. The more physical guy. And Harrison boxed a little bit, but he took a tool. He backed him up, and he was winning. No, no, I'm going to change that. He was dominating that fight. Yeah. He was winning that fight big. He was handling that fight. He was controlling. Now, you could say, if I was doing the commentating, I might have been saying, he's playing with fire here. Because... It was working. He was backing up the more physical guy where the guy was on his back foot where he, he couldn't be effective. And, but he was still giving the more physical guy that chance by being in that chamber, by being in that position, by being in his wheelhouse. But it was working. It was working. It was beautiful. And then it didn't work. Then at the end of the fight, towards the end, he got caught. He got hurt uh, because he backed him up wrong. He, he let a little gap get there, and there was a little gap. I believe it was a left hook, if my memory serves me correctly. There was a little gap where he could get counted, where he could get caught, where he wasn't keeping it tight enough. He was playing with fire. He was, he was walking that, that rope, but he was nice when he was walking it. Mm. It was, uh, you know, he got a lot of cheers while he was up there. You know, all those stories up there above the earth, and he was walking across that line, you know, that 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 tightrope uh, from the, you know, from the Empire State Building, whatever it was for him. And he was getting cheered. And he was feeling like the king. He was feeling like the champ, and he was. And he made a mistake, he got caught. Uh, I thought that it could have continued. The referee, a good referee, but uh, he went down in a bad way. Look, it was a, a strong knockdown. Yeah. And, but then he was recovered. When he got up, he knew what he was doing. He was cognizant of what was going on. He was, he was slipping punches. He was, he was weathering the storm. You know, he knew that he had to be on the defense. I would have liked to give him a little time, mm. a little more time. But yeah. I, you can't argue, I guess, because of the way he went down. But I, I, that, that's my feelings. I'm, I'm going to put it out there all the time, even if it could be criticized for saying, oh, Teddy, you know, he was really hurt. I think I know this business a little bit. Uh, you know, exactly. you know what I mean. It's, yeah. Uh, I mean, we're not, you know, we're not in the opera house. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't want no one hurt, but but I also want to see a guy have a chance, like some of the great fighters over the over the years in this business, come back mm -hmm. if, if if they if it's warranted. You know, and sometimes like that tightrope, it's a tightrope on for for a referee to make that judgment. Same thing. It's a tightrope. It's a tight. I remember years ago, I'm going back probably 35, 40 years ago, I was at the garden with Customato, and we're watching Wilfred Benitez fight uh, Curry. Nobody really knew who Curry was uh, at the time. There was two Currys, and um, this was the one from the West Coast. It was Donald Curry. He became a world champion. This was Bruce Curry, I believe, mm -hmm. and he, was, he came in with Jesse Reed, I believe, and 
he came in from the West Coast. Nobody really knew much about him. And Wilfred Benitez was a great fighter. Uh, still young. He was the youngest world champ ever, 17. Uh, won the junior welterweight title. Then then he won the welter and he won the junior middleweight title. And I worked with him for the welterweight title against Palomino. But we were there because Jim Jacobs, Cus's best friend, and later on the manager for Tyson, had taken over his contract from his father. He, he had bought his contract. So we were there watching the fight and here he is fighting Curry and Benitez again a great fighter uh, youngest world champ ever uh, three time three division went on to be a three division world champ and he gets caught he gets caught and he goes down and his backside's up in the air I mean he, he goes down face first the reason why I say that so descriptively is when that happens it's over usually mm. and a referee won't even look Referee, just stop it. Yeah. See, that's that. It's incompetent. It's incompetent on the referee if he's a real pro to look, mm. not to just react, not to just say it's over because because yeah, it looked bad. But but these these fighters, there's something special with these special fighters where they find a way to come back. To they find a way. They recover. They they find a way. The the same way as you guys recover in life. When devastating things happen, you recover. And some people have more of a capacity to do it. And Benitez, it was incredible. He falls out. But fortunately, it was the great late Arthur McCanty Sr., one of the greatest refs of all time. He was there. He did Ali fights, Frazier fights. He was there. And he didn't just react. He knew what a ref should do. He knew his responsibility. He waited. And he counted. And he watched. And Benitez pulled himself, got his backside in the right position, down, <laughs> instead of up in the air. And he got himself up. And he went 10 rounds, and each round he recovered a little bit. He was gone. But a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, he won the fight. It was incredible. And so this, again, the Harrison fight, I get it. Um, he He fought a heck of a fight, but to the credit of... Charlo, Charlo was better too. He was more active. He was more determined. He didn't overlook, obviously, coming off the loss. He didn't overlook Harrison. Uh, he was better. But the thing that, and I hate that to be on something we just talked about in a pretty positive tone. I got to finish in a negative. The same old crap with the judges. They they had, if Harrison doesn't, if, if he doesn't, get caught there and he goes on and he raises his hands which in his mind he he had the right to he earned it yeah. over 12 rounds he mm -hmm. earned it he he fought he walked a tight rope and he and he got to the other side and he would have put his hands up in the air and guess what he wouldn't have got the win no the judges had him losing they had, a, they had him losing before the knockdown criminal too strong criminal how's that all right just uh, and but too often because we'll be talking about it again next week, some decision somewhere. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's got to stop. It's wrong. But this time, of course, it doesn't explode into that place of controversy because he didn't win, because he got yeah. stopped. But for me, I look at it the same way. If he gets through another round, he's, he gets stopped in another way. Mm -hmm. He gets stopped by the judges. After he earned the right to have his hands lifted. To feel that. To know that, yeah, he took a chance. Yeah, he went into the lion's den. And he came out. You know, it turned out that, obviously, again, took Charlo's credit. I give him the credit. Okay, he caught him late. But, man, the judges, the judges had it out again. We're going to talk about some even worse judging coming up here in the um, Joe Smith-Jesse hard fight. But we'll get to that. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on each fight because we've got a lot yeah, to cover. Yeah, let's move. Let's <clears throat> move, baby. Come on. You're the runner. <laughs> run, run. Next up, John Pascal and Badu Jack. Story of two fights. Pascal dominating early. Jack coming back late. Both guys were down in the fight. Um, two judges had it 114-112 for Pascal. He won the decision. Another judge had it 114-112 for Jack. Incredible fight. I mean, potential candidate for fight of the year. Up yeah. there in the top five, six fights of the year, I think. It was all action, big guys trading big shots. But, um, Pascal down for only the second time in his career. 
What'd you see there? Two different fights. You saw the first fight where it was all Pascal for six rounds. Um, he hurt Bojack, uh, but Dojak, he uh, he was he, he was well ahead. By the and, way, after five rounds, all three judges had a fifty forty four for uh, Pascal. Yeah, well, for, for once they got it right, and uh, I guess they were doing what you're doing. They were wearing their glasses, <laughs> but or whatever. But their vision was clearer. Two fights. Pascal won the first half, and then Badal Jack comes and dominates the second half. And both just as dominantly. Mm -hmm. You know, the way that uh, Pascal dominated the first half, but Badal Jack dominates the second half. But here's the thing. Here's the kicker. That's really, people are going to surprise to hear. I look at my notes. I want to make sure that I bring you what I want to bring you, that I remember. I do the job the right way, I hope. I want to satisfy you. Or I want to piss you off. Not purposely. Not purposely, but saying what I believe should be understood. And sometimes people don't understand it because it doesn't mean I'm right, but my experience tells me that I have a right to say it. And other people can say no because maybe they look at it in a different way. I want to explain the way I look at it. I want to explain not that... I'm trying to educate someone, but I am to a certain extent, and I'm, I'm not trying to do it in uh, as a you know as a guy that knows how to make ice cream. I don't know how to make ice cream. I don't want to do it as a guy that you know knows how to uh, you know how to treat corns on feet. <laughs> I don't know how to treat corns on feet. You know how to podiatrist? The podiatrist. <laughs> that was the name I was looking for. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> But I do want to talk about and educate a little bit about something that, you know, my, has been my life. And you still can disagree, but at least be aware of certain things. Be, be aware. And then there's the other side. There's, there's the dimension of people that don't know and maybe they want to know. That's great. Right? Again, I'm not perfect, but I know more about that than I do about, what's it called, podiatry? <laughs> so, but then there's the others. There's the other group, and you can't win against that group. But I still try, because I'm a stubborn, half-Irish <laughs> maniac, okay? I still try! <laughs> and that, you know who they are, Ken? And one day we're going to have a segment just for these guys. It's the pom-pom guys. <laughs> it's the pom-pom. Carrying the pom-poms. The pom-poms, you know? <laughs> There's a lot of pom-pom guys out there. Yep. They're, they're just cheering for the guy because they got pom-poms, and they're cheering for them. No, no thinking. No, uh, the, uh, the guy's nose used to be here. Now it's over here uh, after the fight. May maybe he didn't win. Uh, now I got pom-poms. <laughs> I got pom-poms. I'm on his side. So, you know, you can't, I mean, that's tough. But this fight with Pascal and Bojack, Bojack, it turned out to be a terrific fight. Along the lines of the same reason, and people will probably say, how can you compare iconic? I know, I, I get it. Along the lines of the Thrill in Manila with Ali and Frazier. And I'll explain. Now, Teddy, come on. You can't mix up these guys with iconic names. Yes, I can. Because I know where I'm going. Because, and get ready, Pascal was shot. And Bordeaux Jack is shot. Pascal is more shot. And I don't want to hurt their feelings or nothing. Bordeaux Jack has half a foot uh, in the shade, uh, so to speak. Pascal has a foot and a half. He... They, he's been in so many tough fights. He's he's done great fights in Canada, in the U.S., everywhere. He's made himself proud. He's been a world champion. I'm I'm proud of you, Pascal. Really, as the way you represent yourself in and out of the ring, both of you as champions. But we do get older. There does come a time, and he his skills have eroded. He 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 is a shop worn fighter. And he was going into that fight. I was surprised that he made it to the distance because his his legs, you could see it. You could see the wear and tear on on the legs, on on the unsteadiness, unsteadiness, if that's a word. I make up words sometimes. But the unsteadiness of his legs, you could see it. And But just like you could see it, if you're going to be honest about it, with Ali and Frazier, they were shot fighters. Yeah, I said it. They were, compared to what they were, they were past their prime. They were. You want to know the truth? That's the truth. But you know what wasn't past their prime? Their character. 
They had championship character and will. That was still, but it was trapped inside these vessels, these, these vessels that were older and eroded and rusty like a rusty ship. The, the captain was still young and vibrant and, and ready to go and take that ship, but the ship was rusty. It had leaks. But boy, it was gallant. It was gallant. It still went out into the ocean, even with water coming in. And that was Ali and Frazier. They went out there. You know why that fight was so great, Ken? It's an iconic fight. It's a historic fight. It was great because both guys were eroded to the point evenly, mm. eroded to where their skills were so diminished that they were just there to hit each other. Mm. So you know what the fight, rather than a great fight, it was a great fight, but you know what it really, if you're going to give the proper description of it, what it really was, it was a brutal fight. Yeah, It was a brutal fight because punches they would have eluded earlier, they couldn't elude. And the only thing that kept them afloat, since I'm using that analogy, the only thing that kept them afloat was this, mm -hmm. their great character. And you get hurt that way. And I'm saying that this fight was along those lines in that way, that Pascal has seen his better days. He's definitely in the twilight, and there's more twilight than light mm. in his career. But his character, he, he, he got through that first half. He got through the whole fight. But you could see it if you see, mm -hmm. if you don't just look and see what you want to see, but if you see and you know what you're seeing. And... Same thing for Badojak, but not to the same degree. And Badojak came on and started to wear him down and almost knocked him out. At the end, a heck of a fight, again, for the same reason that Ali Frazier was a heck of a fight, mm -hmm. because of their diminished skills, but their heart was still there. Their character was still there. So that's what I saw. I saw probably Badojak probably won the fight, should have gotten it. I've seen worse robberies. I, I'm, I'm getting numb. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I agree I, with I'm, you. I'm, we've I'm seen. Getting, I'm getting numb now. We've seen much worse. I, I've seen worse, but he probably could have said he won. But I'm not arguing with it. Uh, I'm tired. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. And so Pascal got it. Uh, terrific fight. There it is. Pascal again going on for an, he'll he'll at least get another payday. I didn't think he'd get through Mark. I'm going to add one thing here. Yeah, you're right. His character and his experience mm -hmm. got him past that, and he dropped Brown uh, to get that win. Yeah, I was at that fight, yeah. and I think Marcus Brown wasn't didn't take it serious enough. And I don't want to say he was clowning, but he was definitely in there, like not focused at times. And uh, he got caught and hurt bad. Like, and he got set up the the experience of Pascal. If I remember yep. correctly, he fainted low with the left hand and came up high with the right hand. Yep. And so trickery, mm -hmm. smart experience you know Very. Uh, uh, all that stuff you know not just throwing punches not just closing the eyes and chucking punches hey it's about more than that mm -hmm. this game uh but i'll say this i'll put a disqualifier out there i'll put a warning out there a warning label out there really pascal and i hate to even put this out there because i don't want to make a prediction on someone i respect so much that's a negative prediction but we're doing this for people to hear the truth, for people to hear things they might not be aware of themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's our job. I, I think that Pascal gets knocked out his next fight. I mean, that's how f you can only you can only run from the devil so long, so to speak. You know what I mean? You can only you know sooner or later. And listen, you could turn around, punch the devil right in his mouth, mm -hmm. and Pascal has done that. He's done that. That's why he's a champion. He definitely makes uh, entertain, that's he's, entertaining fights. That's why he's a champion, fights. and he, he, he does. But I'm just saying that uh, when something's on your tail, it's on your tail. Mm -hmm. And when that something is called old man time, you know, he usually catches you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He usually catches you. Uh, and he's really close. And I think that you got to be aware of that. You have to be cognizant of that. That Pascal, uh, as much as I respect him, his, whoever gets him in the next fight is going to have a guy that is going to have a real good chance to win against Pascal because of where he is at uh, at, at this point in his career. Yep, I'm with you. Well, anyway, great fight there. Let's jump to the main event in the, on that card. Javante Davis um, 
Uriakis Gamboa to start out um, fights at 135, a step up in weight for um, Tank Davis, and Tank misses weight by almost two pounds. Uh, he weighed in at 136.2, 1.2 pounds over. First of all, he showed up an hour late for the initial weigh-in. Then they, then uh, Showtime and PBC announced they're going to give him an hour to make weight. That becomes two hours per the WBA. Now, that he has two hours after the original weigh-in, but if you're already an hour late... When does the clock start running? The point is, there was nothing he was going to do to miss the weight. The WBA boxing, was the giving is, him that it's belt. It's boxing, unfortunately. I'm going to let you continue, but I have to jump in. It's boxing. And, I mean, if IBM ever ran IBM the way boxing runs boxing, it would be IMB. I don't know what that stands for. <laughs> but but it's, 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 it's not what it's supposed to stand for. But go on. The... Um I like Tank Davis as a fighter. He seems like a nice kid, but the people around him with the like crap they put on the internet and the the, the Twitter fans and they're, they're like, I put out a tweet that this is crazy. I mean, are there rules or are there no rules? Or they're making them up as they go. You wouldn't believe the uh, vitriol that 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 the the Davis can't, fans came out with. I'm like, dude, these are just facts. I'm not making this up. He has okay, he has two hours, but when does the two hours start from the original? Anyway, the whole thing was a sham. The commissioners left. It was just the WBA there when he when he weighed in again and made the limit. Like I said, there was no way he wasn't winning that title. And then on to the fight. Um, very controversial. Allegedly, Gamboa claims he ruptured his Achilles tendon, and maybe he did. He came out with doctor's reports and stuff. And the fight aside, I've seen people rupture their Achilles. It looks like they've been shot with a sniper rifle. They're down. The Achilles is completely detached from the foot. You can't really move your foot. Now, clearly something happened when he had some kind of injury, but... Regardless of what they say or what, what doctor reports they put out, it seems hard to believe that he had a ruptured Achilles, but whatever. He had an injury, and credit to him, he fought 12 rounds. I think the injury happened in like the second, maybe. Um, nevertheless, a fight that Tank should have probably got him out of there, and he didn't. He went 12 hard rounds with an injured Gamboa, regardless of what the injury was. He was clearly injured. Um, in a fight that everyone just assumed it would be a blowout. I think the odds were massive, but they were. Tank gets the decision. Um, what did you see in that one? I saw another shot fighter. How's that for a start? Mm. You know? I mean, uh, I didn't know this was going to be shot fighter day, but I, I, I mean, Gamboa, again, people get mad at me. Hey, what, what, what am I going to do? What can I do? It's called counseling. Go somewhere. You know? Really. Uh, uh, you know, Find someone to talk to, and complain about Teddy. <laughs> really, it, it's 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 pretty uh, popular. <laughs> yeah, you could probably find a few people to do it with. Uh, listen, Gamboa, I love Gamboa. Uh, he's a former gold medalist from the great Cuban team, national team uh, in the Olympics. He's a f uh, he's a former world champion. He's he he's got great hand speed, great talent. Really, really a talented guy but he's beyond his best you know he, he's been stopped by Crawford he's been dropped by uh, he's I think he got stopped by someone else who was uh not a Crawford <laughs> put it that way and uh you know he it looked I tell you in some ways the funny thing about it is that I mean going in the odds were big not only that Gamboa couldn't win, but that he couldn't last the distance because of what I'm saying. I think he'd been dropped like eight times in his last X amount of fights. Uh, I mean, there's a reason for what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, he looked like a shot fighter. Yeah. Now, I give all the credit in the world. He got in that ring and, you know, he showed all the heart in the world, but there was some strange stuff happening. Some strange stuff there, man. You know, he gets dropped in the second round. We don't know. I guess he tore his tent, whatever. It was so he got hurt. He get he he has trouble getting up. He tells the referee he can't continue. Yeah, that's that's the, another. And the point. referee makes him continue. Yep. It's a weird, some weird stuff, man. But then he continues and he fights like not like a guy who's been who's giving up. But he clearly told him like I can't go. My, I've, I've got I mean, there was a few rounds he's walking around like like you know still like showing everyone. Hey, uh, I'm hurt. Uh, my my wheels aren't good. You know what I mean? I'm. You got me. I still got some miles ahead of me. I got a flat tire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually you, you you don't drive on a flat tire. You change it. And he 
he shows all the heart in the world, resiliency. But here's the thing for me. He shows a chin that we had no reason to expect him to show. Yeah. I just said it. He got it dropped eight times in X amount of fights. He'd been stopped a few times. He, I mean, he he hadn't shown that kind of resiliency, that kind of endurance physically. And here he is. Why would we think he would show it against a guy who's a tremendous puncher? Yeah. If nothing else, you can't argue that Davis is a really big puncher. Strong. And, and, and at a bigger weight. At a bigger weight. So, you know, it's just pretty amazing. Uh, so he he goes now. Look, Davis came in heavy. Did he probably didn't take him serious? All those things that factor. Maybe Davis. I'm gonna run down the list. What could it be? Besides the heart that maybe at the end of the day I go right to the last one. The heart that Gambo showed. Okay, I got you. I got you. But let's go down the list. Uh, maybe he overlooked him. Uh, you know, and I'm not taking nothing away from Gamboa, but maybe he overlooked him, Davis. And I'm not making excuses for Davis. Maybe he's not as good as we thought he was. Maybe, maybe you know, knocking out, drilling all these guys that he's been drilling. Maybe we got carried away in our evaluation of him. Maybe. Or, or maybe he got weakened. Nobody mentioned this. Uh, I don't think anybody mentioned this during the fight that we're commentating, but maybe he got weakened from making weight, you know, because he came in heavy. You don't know how much weight he had to lose even to get to that weight. Well, he clearly had a lot of weight to lose. You don't show up at the weigh-in a pound plus yeah. overweight. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. And then he still, like I said, he had to lose. A, a lot of people might have sort of evaluated in their head. Well, he only had to lose a pound and a half or two pounds, you know, whatever. But no. He might have lost 15 well, overnight. Who knows what he lost, you know, getting to that to that place within only a pound. Um these yeah. guys are talking about him like he's a pay-per-view fighter. I just don't see it. I mean, I get their enthusiasm as handlers, but unless he's going to step up massively in competition, like no one wants to see him fight. I know the commentators. Fighters. I was it's looking a, for my note. I was, yeah. I was, I was trying to figure out what I was wanting to say. That the commentators, instead of talking about that Davis, or that he might have been weakened by what we just talked about, they were talking about that uh, the bigger Gamboa was able to handle his punches mm -hmm. which sometimes could be the case yeah but i i don't know if they did their due diligence but gamboa is not the bigger guy he used to be a featherweight mm -hmm. so i was like confused by that like wait a minute okay you could say that maybe he's fighting a bigger guy that that he's able to handle punches uh from davis uh because he's naturally bigger but he's not he was a featherweight he had moved up yeah, but the commentators are going to say anything they can to promote the, the A-side fighter. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not taking shots at them, but I'm just saying our job is to say everything that's out there, you know, uh, to try to allow people to have their own thoughts at the end of the day, but to have the information to have those thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to do, Yeah, you know. And at the end of the day, you could look at all the things I just said, um, it was surprising that he was able to go with a bad leg. It was surprising that he was able to withstand those punches, everything else. And maybe it's a wake-up moment for Davis that, you know, you can't just hang pelts on a wall uh, knocking guys out, that there's more to it than that, mm -hmm. that maybe you have to take a little self-inventory and saying, what else do I got? What else do I got when the power is not going to be there for me? And some days it's not. When the power is not going to be there for me, what else do I have? You know, he knows how to fight and all that, but what else do I have? You know, what? it can't be with the better fighters, it can't be just the power. Mm -hmm. It has to be more. And again, he I'm not saying he don't know how to fight. I'm just saying that this can, a win sometimes can serve. It doesn't have to be a loss to be a wake-up call. Mm hmm be curious to see who he gets next. Um, love to see him step up big in competition and fight the top guys in the divisions because... Like Loman Chanko? <laughs> I'd love to see that fight. That would be power versus um, technique versus, you know, guile. Power versus guile versus... Uh, it would test him just... We were touching on it. It would test Davis in the mental areas. Oh, big time. You know, okay, you got a big punch. What else do you got that's big? 
You know what I mean? All right. You know, I the, the power's not going to be enough tonight. Maybe it will, but maybe it won't. I don't see them making that fight anytime soon. They've been saying for the last, like, two or three years that Floyd and um, Leonard Ellaby saying, uh, oh, Lomachenko's only getting older. It's clear that they're waiting for him to get yeah, older. Well, Floyd's and, smart. I mean, he's Floyd, we all talk about, you know, the money he's made, but, and, but he's smart. And we talk about how smart he is in the ring. He's been pretty smart in business, too, and in being a manager, even a matchmaker, picking the spots. Pretty yeah, they have smart. this kid Davis selling out the arena or close to in uh, Atlanta. He has a huge following um, of other professional athletes. So, But at some point, you've got to like step up and beat some like big names. And uh, for guys he's been fighting, don't fall under that category. Um, now, next fight I want to get to with you was um, just recently, actually. This one was hard to watch because he's a friend of the show. Julian J. Rock Williams loses to Jason Rosario, gets stopped in, uh, I don't know, was it the third or fourth round? I mean, just got run over. And I, and it, it pains me to say that because he's such a nice guy. We've had him on the show. I consider him a friend. But my God, I don't know if he um, was looking past Rosario or he had a bad camp and his trainer, Stephen um, Breadman Edwards, also very nice guy. I, I really like these guys. So it was hard to watch, but um, Rosario just ran him over, stopped him. Um, some questions about the stoppage at the end, but I mean, if you watch it in slow-mo, one of the last shots he hit him with his eyes, uh, J-Rock's eyes rolled back. He got caught with an uppercut, was on the ropes, were holding him up, and he was taking a beating. Uh, no real protest on the stoppage there, but... Curious to hear what you think, and then I want to talk to you about the um, relationship between fighter and trainer when something like this happens. Because I was telling you when I was watching the fight, like it's so incredibly difficult to watch someone you like lose like this. It's not like losing a basketball game when you're watching someone get their head punched in, and especially in a fight that you think they're going to win. It was just it's 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 very difficult emotional to watch when you have a relationship with the guy. So I want to talk to you about the close relationship which is unless you've been in that position it's hard to even describe between trainer and fighter but first let's talk about the fight i mean i'm assuming you saw what i described but let me hear what you think sorry fifth round stoppage yeah listen we got to know um williams as you said we had him on our show uh, how many months ago was that? That was a while ago. Yeah, almost a year ago after he beat Jared Hurd. So it was, you know, it was when we were still starting up yep. and building. Uh, which, thanks to you guys, uh, we're a couple of floors higher. <laughs> Thank you. And if you guys like it, we'll keep liking it and keep doing it. As long as you show us the love, we'll give the love right back to you. I, that fight... See, I look at things the way I look at them. I, I see the fighters, but I see the stories behind them. I see where they come from. I see where they wanted to go and where they go. How they were before they got there, how they were when they're there. You know, where they're going and where they are. And what I mean by that is you got... It reminds me a little bit of the Cancio fight, another kid we had on early. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to know him. Yep. And you've had him over your house. Mm -hmm. Great kid, great family. Most of these fighters are. Mm -hmm. And they come from tough places. And this is their way of getting out, getting mm -hmm. to the, take care of their families, getting to a better place. And that's what's so magnificent about boxing is that no matter where you come from, no matter who your parents are, no matter, you know, your ethnicity, your creed, your religion, you know, uh, ups and downs, how life has been tough to you, bad to you, whatever. All those things, no matter what, on one given night, if you trained hard enough, if you believed hard enough, you can get in that ring and you can make everything right. You can straighten out all problems. You can straighten out all of the past. In one given night in 36 minutes, you can get in that ring. And it doesn't matter how small you are. It doesn't matter how you got picked on. It doesn't matter how everybody said you were garbage. It doesn't matter that your family wasn't quite what you want them to be. It doesn't matter that the sun didn't always shine on you. 
On that night, you can get in that ring and you can be called champion of the world. World champion, have your hand raised. And it's powerful, it's special, it's magnificent. And these guys rise up to the moment. That's part of what carries them there. And Concio, when he did it, he was the Rocky. He was the underdog. Big underdog against, I think it was Maldonado. Machado. 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 Uh, uh, 20 and 0 at the end of uh, Southpaw, the time. right? Southpaw. Yeah. Lanky, dangerous Had the great guy. Freddie Rose with him, you know, right? Everything. Golden boy superstar. Yeah. So, and, and what's he do? He upsets the apple cart. Rocky movie, baby. Real life. Mm-hmm. And the same thing, I saw the same thing here with Julian Williams, you know. He, he upsets Hurd, and, you know, he, he wins the title. A kid from Philly, Rocky. He had been stopped by Charlo earlier in yeah. his career. It, it was beautiful. And here's the thing in both those fights, why I bring them together, Kenny, is that I saw the Concio fight all over again in the Williams fight, where Concio is in there. He's got everything going, what I just described, to have the opportunity to win the world title. He wins the world title, he defends it. Then he fights another guy, a guy that nobody thought anything of. Rene Alvarado. There it is. And Alvarado got touched by the, the Rocky touch. He, he got touched by what I just described, that tonight can be my night to make life fair, to make life right, to rectify all the wrong that's been wrong. Nobody owns that. It's up for bid <laughs> every time you get in the ring. For you people out there, same thing in life. Same thing. It's up for bid. Are you willing to bid? Are you willing to put your hand up? Say, I want that. <laughs> and Concio was. But on this given night, Alvarado had the same feeling. And he dominated. Hard to watch that and, one. Man. And tough. But, but it's along the line of what you're saying. It was so great you brought it up. It's perfect because it's human. And these are human beings. These aren't fighting robots. And then in the Julian Wing, we like this kid. As I said, we had him on our show. Terrific kid. Terrific kid. He lives the right life. Everything. And he went in there and he upset her. And now in his first defense, he fights Rosario, a guy that... What was the line? I mean, he was a... He was anywhere from 10 to 20 to 1 underdog. I mean, and, and again, but Rosario, that night, he said, I want it. Because it's open bidding. Anybody can bid on being a world champ, on wanting to be the best. No matter where you come from. <laughs> no matter if you're 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 100 to 1. Underdog. It don't matter. It don't matter. And I saw the same thing. You, you with me? Yeah. You with me? Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do that. I love that. I, I love I, I love being in church with the Baptist churches when I, I, it just rises you up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, can I get an amen? Amen. And that's what it was. That's what I was watching. That's why I'm describing it this way. It's not just, you know, it's just not lefts and rights. Mm-hmm. And they flip scripts like the Eddie Murray movie, Trading Places. Eddie Murphy. Yeah, Eddie Murphy. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's why you're here. One <laughs> of the reasons. Many other reasons. Many others. And Rob's going to get that up there. I know it. He's going to put that up there with it. And, and, they, <laughs> and, and they, so that's what it was. It was, it was, it was Rosario flipping the script. He, he said, tonight's my turn. It's open bidding. I can behave. I can feel that I'm going to be a champ. And he felt like he was going to be a champ. He came in there ready. 10 to 1, 20 to 1. I don't care. Underdog. He came in there ready. Now, did Julian lose a little something after winning the title? That's only for him to know. He had a long layoff, almost yeah, a year off. But that's only for him to know. He wanted, he got, did, he, did his thirst get quenched? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know, but all I know is the other guy was thirsty. It hadn't been quenched yet. And he behaved the way Julian Williams behaved when he won the title. Mm -hmm. Again, it's that Rocky syndrome. And listen, there's tangible stuff to this fight too. 
Uh, Rosario, you know, did they overlook him? Did his did the people with Williams? And I'm not looking to knock them up, but again, my job is to point it all out. That they, I'm not, I hate to say, didn't do their homework, but were they not aware that this guy, what I saw, that this guy was tall and long? He had a long reach, and the guy could punch because he was built like one of those wiry guys that usually get good leverage, good good talk. You know what I mean? Yeah. He could punch. He 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 catch on the end of those punches. He get good leverage, good talk, get everything behind it. And like I said, he you know he had all those physical assets, and he had the confidence. He had he had the gleam in the eye. You know that I hate it from the Rocky movie, but the Eye of the Tiger. Mm. I'm being a little corny over here, <laughs> but you know what I mean. For well, one side note, there um, I heard Stephen Edwards doing an interview the week uh, week before the fight, and they said that in the build up for the Hurt fight, they Stephen had said to J Rock, "Let's bring in Rosario as a sparring partner," and J Rock told him, "No, no, no." That kid's good. We're going to eventually fight him. I don't want to spar with him if I'm going to fight him in the next one or two fights. If I win, he's probably next in line. So they didn't bring him in to spar. But so J Rock knew enough to, like, this is before the fight even happened. So clearly they knew, J Rock knew this kid was dangerous. So I have a hard time believing he overlooked him, but you never know. You just never know how Ken, the camp Ken, went. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that, and I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We don't know. We're not inside his his body, his heart, his soul. But I do know that human beings are complex. They're not machines. It's not about oil and water, you know, in the in the carburetor or oil in the motor. It, it's uh, or water in the uh, not carburetor. You have a problem if you put in the carburetor. <laughs> radiator. A radiator. I'm sorry. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a car mechanic. I'm, <laughs> I I I just know boxing. I mean, a lot of other things I just don't know too good. Um, now I realize years ago why that car went bad. <laughs> I put water in the carburetor <laughs> instead of the radiator. Well, that's yeah. Anyway, I'm saying that a fighter, as much as you can be aware, when that thing reaches out and touches you, whether it's called overconfidence, whether it's whether it's called overlooking, whether it's whether you're touched by victory. You know, success I once said this to the New York Jets when I was in Mangini, when I was training them for three years. I was working with them years ago when Mangini was their head coach. Real smart guy. I once said that, and they were winning some games finally. I once said, success can be like a martini. It can relax you. And you know about martinis. You like your martini. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> you know, and, and it can be... It can relax you. It can. It's great. We all strive for it. We all we, we, we all aspire to it. We dream. We, we scratch and claw to get to success. What do we do when we get there? Nobody knows for sure until you're there. Nobody. Nobody does. And, and it can relax you. It can, like a martini. It mm -hmm. can. Even though you don't realize it's doing it. It, it happens. It can happen. Am I making excuses for Julian Williams? It's not an excuse because it's up to you not to let it happen, mm -hmm. to be cognizant of it, to be in control of it. But be aware of it. But I'm just saying it's possible. It's possible. It's something that it's hard to quantify. It's just there. Well, Julian handled it like a gentleman afterwards. Oh, yeah. He was well, very he complimentary of Rosario, and uh, I suspect we'll see Julian again soon. Coming back like he did after the Charlo loss. So good luck to him. Hope to see him soon. Last boxing match I want to talk to you about Joe Smith and uh, Jesse Hart. Um, I think on paper, Joe, Joe Smith Jr. was brought in to be an opponent. Um, he obviously had other plans. Took it to Jesse Hart. Um, gave him a pretty good one-sided beatdown. But what I want to talk to you about afterwards, I mean, everyone who watched this fight had Joe Smith winning. I mean, he beat him from pillar to post. And um, Judge James Kinney. I think it's important that we start like mentioning these guys by name because this guy James Kinney shouldn't be working anymore. I mean, he had Jesse Hart win in the fight 95-94. I'm pretty sure there isn't a person on earth who watched this fight and thought Jesse Hart won this fight. I mean, it was a 
complete domination by Joe Smith Jr. Credit to him. But my God, this the only reason I brought this fight up is to talk about this score because otherwise it was a pretty uneventful one-sided beating. Um, curious what you saw there. I mean, I can't imagine you saw anything different, but love to hear your thoughts on uh, James Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> Kenny, who's... It's, you know, there's something wrong when you're talking about the judges. We're supposed to be talking about the important people. Judges, unfortunately, turn out to be important when they don't do their job right. Hey, they're important if they do their job right, so maybe I should go back on that. Okay. But their importance should not outweigh what's going on in the ring because they their impact, maybe that's a better way of saying it, judges' impact should not outweigh the impact that the fighters put forward inside the ring with lefts and rights. It shouldn't, but it does. Way too often. Way, 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 way too often in this business. And um, again, this is a time where it doesn't hurt Smith, but it could have. He took care of business. And fortunately, the crazy thing is we shouldn't be talking about him squeaking out a split decision because he did what you said. He dominated. Dominated. But I'm going to go one thing for the benefit of the fighter that you didn't touch on. They'll go, like you said, you know, you made him sound like the ugly duckling. And listen, uh, uh, there are ugly ducklings out there. But, you know, and, and I'm not, don't, don't get, uh, get mad at me if you want. Okay, whatever. <laughs> well, like, I can't control that. But it, it's kind of like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. All right, Ken? Sometimes you, you got a gorgeous girl who could be a walk walkway model runway. runway model right and um and and then you have one that's maybe not maybe blessed with quite that kind of you know outstanding beauty that that just strikes you like like a fighter with that doesn't have that outstanding talent that just strikes you you know in the ways that we think of talent speed and finesse and power whatever uh you know footwork you know, agility, all those things that we, neon things that we like to get excited about, right? Mm -hmm. right? And the same thing with the girl. You know, we we we, we see the beauty. We see the, 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 the cosmetic part of it. We see that's so easy to see, but we don't see the beauty inside. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to get to know the person. Uh, you have to go through situations to see, oh, this is a generous person. This is a selfless person. This is a beautiful person. I, I Gee, I didn't realize how beautiful she was. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so we should change Smith a little bit by saying, you know, nobody expects him to win, which, which could be true. But a lot of people didn't expect him to win except his people. But this is a guy who has all the beauty. Mm -hmm. He's determined. He's very physical. He's got a good right hand. He punches good with the right hand. Yeah, he he can be uh, he can be uh, rough around the edges, and he is rough around the edges. He's not developed in a lot of the areas I just mentioned, as far as agility, as far as full dimensions of him, where he can do a lot of different things. He is a force. He is a wrecking ball that's looking to wreck you. Mm -hmm. And but there's some beauty to that, that a guy can be that determined for twelve rounds, that can keep up that kind of relentless pursuit for 12 rounds and not get broken down or discouraged. He brought that. That's what Joe Smith is. Joe Smith is a determined, strong, physical guy that's not the prettiest, but when you get past what's pretty, there's some pretty good stuff there mm -hmm. that, that matters in that ring, that his managers look at and say, look pretty beautiful to me tonight, <laughs> you know? And he brought that. And he was bigger than Hart. Hart's a, really a middleweight that moved up, middleweight, super middleweight, that moved up to light heavyweight. And he was a bigger guy, the more physical guy, the more determined guy. Hart was the more polished guy, the more sophisticated guy. But again, that's what's great about this business, that you can be the less sophisticated guy, the less talented guy in those areas and still win mm -hmm. if you have these other assets we just described. If you're determined, if you're, if you work hard enough, and so Smith 
dominates the fight. Uh, and there's no other way to say it. Mm -hmm. He dominates the fight. And we got to be talking about a judge. So how do you how do you figure that? It can either be incompetence or corruption. There can't be anything else. There's there's no other. You know, it's kind of like that, that when you do the thing. You got different choices on the on 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 the test. Mm -hmm. it, it can be only there's only four boxes, three boxes. In this case, two boxes. What else could it be? But I I would have to argue nobody could be that incompetent. Yep. It, it would be like it would be like if you were a, a farmer. And you were growing apples, and your your specialty you're 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 an apple guy, apple farmer, whatever. And you go out and you start picking watermelons, <laughs> thinking they're apples. <laughs> I would argue that no one could be that incompetent. <laughs> I would argue that you know the difference between apples and watermelons. <laughs> uh, am I making a decent point here? <laughs> yes. You would know, right? Even if you're an apple farmer, you would know that that's, I don't know what that is, but it, it, it ain't an apple. <laughs> one grows it, on a tree and one a, grows on the ground. It's not a Macintosh. <laughs> and that ain't no Macintosh. I, I'm not bringing that to my teacher and putting that on the table to, uh, uh, to impress my teacher to get a better grade. I heard of an apple day, not a watermelon a day keeps the doctor away. I mean, you would know what it is. So it couldn't, you, there's no incompetence that broaches that level. There's not. I feel like in You're any a boxing other judge. You know who's winning to, to some level. So what is it, Ken? I feel it's something like we in, don't, no, no, I'm going to stay with It's something we don't talk about enough. It, it's, it's this game. It's not right. Because you're risking yourself when you get... It's not right. Ken, it's not right. I'm freaking tired. I really am. Now I'm getting to a serious place. I, I'm tired. I, I'm tired of fighting for this, for the fighters. I care about them. Uh, I care about the sport. I care about the fans. I, I, I care about myself. I care about my, my family, how, what they think I stand up for, what, I, what matters to me, how I conduct myself as a person. I care about all those things, but I'm tired. I'm tired of caring about a sport, an industry, a business that doesn't do anything for my care. When, when you care to a point where, I'm not trying to make myself sympathetic, but you care to a point where you put yourself out there, you fight for the sport, you fight for the fighters, you you. you Try to rail against what's wrong, injustices, to the point that you hurt yourself. You hurt yourself, that means you're being, sometimes I wonder, sometimes I battle with this again, where I wonder if I'm being responsible to my family. They come first. Where I've been hurt in the sport by saying things, and, and, but I say them because of the reason I just said. My family would want me to say them. I would want them to say them when they get to that point in their lives. But... I start to wonder, is it worth it? Is the hurt worth it? And you know, you start to question, did, did I do the right thing fighting for this sport that doesn't fight for itself? That no one else fights, you know, for the fans, for whatever you want to call it, for myself. But is it worth it when, when you get punished for it? And it winds up hurting your family. And I just feel tired. I mean, that, you know... Nothing is done. I look at baseball. They're going crazy over the Houston Astros, and rightfully so, about stealing signs. And they're, they're just going down the line, like, like, and they're firing people. Can they eliminate the, Can It's like a movie where the guys come in with the spacesuits on when there's a germ out there. You know, when they think there's an outbreak of a virus. You know that movie, uh, the outbreak? And, and they come in with the uniforms on. And they come in and, they, and they're disinfecting everything. <clears throat> they're, they're wiping everything out. You know, they come right in. Uh, they don't play around. You don't see that in boxing. Nope. Nobody's coming in with spacesuits. No, we wouldn't even need spacesuits. I, I, I'd be satisfied. I'd be satisfied with a napkin. 
<laughs> I, I, I be, uh, <laughs> really, I mean, Windex. One of those uh, Win- face, face masks. Uh, yeah, face masks. <laughs> a little Windex. Uh, something to clean this stuff up. And you don't see it. And like getting back to the baseball, why are they doing this? Because they have to. Because they have a commission in place. We don't have that. A national com- Because they have police in place. They have something in place to make sure that things are cleaned up before they get a ray that that need to be cleaned up or cleaned up Mm -hmm. that they're straightened out that they're handled that they're not ignored they're not swept under the rug why because the credibility of the sport is at risk the credibility of our sport has been at risk forever it keeps getting chipped away at you can only chip away at something so long. It's like the ocean, you know, that keeps coming and coming. And, and, and you're walking one day, you're walking by the ocean one day, and all of a sudden you notice there's not that much beach left. Where did it go? Where did it go? The ocean eroded it. The waves have been hitting it for a long time. One day you're going to say, where did our sport go? Where did it go? Because these judges were like the ocean. They kept eroding it, taken away from it, being allowed to disintegrate it, to destroy it. What do you want to wait until one day it's not there no more like the, like the shore and there's no beach to walk on? That's, I feel like that freaking guy in the movie, that movie where he opened up the windows and said, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> I can't take it anymore. I, at the end, I wanted to do more than just rant. I wanted to ask these people something. I don't know. Do you hear me? You can do something. You can. And it's time you do something if you feel that way. Because you're going to see another bad decision next week. Probably in about 10 minutes. (laughs) I mean, really. You could do something. And I'm asking you to do something. Ken, I'm asking you to do something. You can, you have the power, just like you, you get down sometimes, you see these awful politicians and you say, what can I do? You could vote. You could vote. You still got that power. You could vote. You could vote. Stop watching them. Start, start letting them, whether you send letters, whatever, do it with your feet. Walk. Stop watching when you know that the guys are getting robbed and you know it's wrong. Stop watching. Let the promoters know. Let, let the networks know. Let, 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 let the commissions know. Let them know that you, you're going to walk away from this sport that you love because they're making it ugly. They're allowing it to be. They're not doing their job. You could call your assemblyman. No, really, do a little something. Call your assemblyman. Do you know the commissions are paid by us with the mm-hmm. taxpayers' money, most of them, right? Mm-hmm. Call, your commission, call your assemblyman and say, listen, my tax dollar pays. You're my assemblyman. I'm your constituent, right? Yes, yes, sir, Mr. Smith. Listen, I am a big boxing fan. I am tired of watching fights where fighters get robbed and the commissioners who are paid by my tax dollars don't do freaking diddly squat. Nothing. I want you to represent me. I'm on my rope's end. I want you to do something. I want something done. Do something. Do something. Do something. Do something. Wouldn't you think, even if you were the promoter of the network, after that fight in particular, and you look, there's no secret, right? They want the A-side guy to win. They want Jesse Hart to win. Like, that, let's not beat around but, the But listen, and let me just f- put a cap, and then you go. That, well, the thing is, he didn't get robbed. Because, because you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, two of the judges got it right. But, but one of them was, that judge, why is he going to be working next week? Like I talked about baseball coming in and cleaning the house, disinfecting. Th- th- this guy would have been disinfected in baseball. He, w- he would have been gone. He wouldn't be. He'd be working again next week. No, oh, I know. He'd be working again. Like all these other judges in the history of the sport. And yeah, this one, we got lucky. Smith got it. But it shouldn't have been a split. To- and then there's other ones that, that they don't get it. They get robbed. And they're never going to get a chance to be in that position again. You know why? Because now they, it's hard to rob people even in baseball now because they have videotape. Mm. But I remember watching a game where it was a World Series. I think it was Kansas City versus, I can't remember. And it, anyway, and the guy was safe at first and they caught him out. 
Said, ah, oh, they got the call wrong. They didn't have instant replay. They got it wrong. Damn! And But then the next inning, he got a chance to get up and, and make it, you know, make yeah. up for it. Yeah. And, and you know, and they were going to play again the next day. Mm-hmm. Boxing, you don't get that chance to get up again. You get, you get that win that you've worked your whole life for, for the world title, ripped away from you. You might never get that again. You got to go back in the line. And when you go back in the line, it's not like going back in the lineup, back in the dugout, mm. where you sit there and you chew bazooka bubble gum, mm-hmm. and, and then you wait to get up again, and then you put a few donuts on the bat, and you warm up, and <laughs> that, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. You got to go back in the line and take punches mm-hmm. from somebody. You might never get there again. You got to take more punches again to get to where you already were. Mm-hmm. That some piece of garbage robbed you. I'm sorry. I, 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 that was too harsh. Some piece of garbage robbed you. Some freaking guy who doesn't care about any of those things. Care about what you did. Care about your family. None of that. And they, and they, and they just rob you for whatever reason. And being that there's no police, and who knows? The, it could be because the house fighter, because the, the judges, well, Teddy, what's the, what's the motivation? Well, it's pretty simple. The judges know they're not going to work again because the promoters have influence of who's the judge. Of course. So, so, and they're ones who are putting the work out, the employment. They're the employers. So I want to work. I want to be a judge. But if I don't give it to, the, to their guy, I don't work again. It happens. Mm-hmm. It happens. So that could be one thing, right? But in such an unpoliced environment, it could be a million other things, Ken. That's what scares me even more. It could be a mean, uh, nobody's watching, there's no commission, it's not like baseball, we just said it. Mm-hmm. It could be a mean thing. It could be that a judge just doesn't, a judge might be friendly with a guy. There's nobody separating those things, making sure, uh, hey, you know, like a jury, uh, you you can't have contact with, with the person who's on trial. We'll, we'll call it a mistrial. There's somebody watching. There's nobody watching to see if this judge is friends with uh, having, going out to dinner with this fighter. There's there's no watching that. Never mind so, if he's friends with the fighter. What no, about if he's the friends manager, with a big handicapper? The, the manager, whatever. But it could be that simple. That I have the power. I can do this. That, damn it, I can do this. I can give it to my buddy for whatever reason. And we'll get into your point. What, someone can't get to him and say, hey, uh, drew, drew another party and say, hey, you know, here's uh, X amount of dollars for you. Take care of my boy. I, it's so, I, I, I never thought I'd be talking about this, really. I really mean it. And I know people, some people are going to get, oh, my God. How can you say, oh, my God? How can you listen to what I just said and say it's not possible? More than possible. Probable. In this business. With everything we've seen. With the history of it. With the lack of policing. Wouldn't you think that after the fight, the promoter and or the network would pull that guy aside and be like, listen, we, I, I get it. You're trying to help us out, but you just... What are you doing? Like, th- that's a one-sided beatdown. How are you scoring it like that? You're making us look crazy. Like, there's no... There's like no shame in it. It's like oh, on to the next one. Like you said, the guy's going to be working next week. I'm sure of it. Anyway, there, there, there would not be a line on that for you to bet on that in Vegas. <laughs> no. And Vegas lets you bet on everything. Yeah, you bet on a flip of a coin. The Super Bowl coming up. Uh, you can't bet on that because they know it would be a loser for them. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, I want to talk to you about two recent UFC fights. First. Um, Kamaru Usman and Colby Covington fought back on December 14th. And the only reason I want to talk about it is because they're both world-class, I think, all-American wrestlers. Like, a lot of people expected it to be a wrestling match, but they basically stood for four and a half rounds and punched each other I got a little heat up. Would it be all right? We're, we're regular show. We're, yeah. we're, the, we're you guys, right? We, we're just, we don't hide nothing. We don't. <laughs> I got a little heat up. Can I take this off while, of course. while you're talking? Of course. We, we don't even have to skip this and cut it and be <laughs> cute and be fancy. I'm taking my freaking sweatshirt off. We never, right? we never edit anything. <laughs> yeah, so um, I know you've seen this fight. Kamaru Usman stops Colby Covington uh, in the fifth round of their fight. But what I wanted to talk to you about was, number one, it was a stand-up fight where they basically just both punched the crap out of each other. But in the end of the third round, heading right before that round ended, uh, Usman punched Covington in the jaw and broke his jaw. And Covington went back to the corner and told us, going, I think I broke my jaw. And um, But then carried on fighting for another round and a half. Behave like a fighter. Behave yep. like a champ. Go ahead. You keep going. I just had to jump in. Yeah, that's and, it, And though. one other thing. Precedent. These guys are special. Mm. 
That's why you can't pay him enough money for me. Why I'm always on their side. Oh, Teddy, this guy got a hundred me. Yeah, give him a hundred ten. <laughs> gets in that octagon, he gets in that ring. Give him whatever he can get. Give him whatever he can. And and the, and they the right ones, guys like this, justify it. Yeah, they show you that. They remind you because of their behavior, because of what they go through. What you just pointed out, and I, I, there's a precedent for Ali Norton. A lot of people forget, but I'll bring it right up. Ali, the great Ali. What made him so great? Ted, oh, he was born with speed, and he was born. And there was more than that, because when the speed wasn't there anymore later on, he still won titles because of his character, because of his determination, because of his specialness, because of his choices. And, and by the way, just remember that out there. There's a great power in choices. And it's a great, great power. You don't have to be a fighter to make choices, to make strong choices. Choices that can put you on top when you want on top can change your life. And they make choices, these guys. Choice to fight with a broken jaw. And Ali in the first fight with Ken Norton, a lot of people didn't know Norton then, uh, got a broken jaw early. Fought the whole fight. He lost. He lost the fight. But he fought the whole fight with a broken jaw. And then he went on, fought Norton two more times, and he won two decisions. One of them I was at at Yankee Stadium. I, uh, I think it was 1976. It uh, might have been. I'm not sure what year it was. But I was there at Yankee Stadium with Cus uh, uh, for the third. Because I had gone to training camp to see Ali getting ready for the third. Oh, what a treat yeah. that was. <laughs> but that, anyway, uh, so, yeah. he. The thing that struck me for this fight was that if you didn't know better, other than... The small gloves and that their feet were bare. <laughs> you think you were watching a boxing match because and because there was there wasn't even a a hint of going to the floor mm -hmm. of of rap grappling or or jujitsu or anything. Not that that stuff can't be beautiful, but we like the striking. It's mm. you know to watch that. At least we do, and a lot of people do. And you would have thought you were watching a boxing match and at a pretty good level. At a really good level yeah. because they knew what they were doing, strikers mm -hmm. instead of boxing. But these guys, you would never know that it was, other than what I said, that it was a UFC that involves sometimes a lot of grappling because the, it didn't seem to even be on their mind. They didn't even hint at it. They, they were there to strike. They were there to box. They were oh, there they, to fight. They, they had a lot and, of bad and, blood. And, and, but, but I'm just saying that it was, it was a great fight. And, and it was, for me, a boxing guy, not a UFC guy, not an MMA guy, but I have respect for them. I have respect for all people that get involved in, obviously, this kind of craft, that, the vocation of this, what it takes. Uh, mixed martial arts, you know, anything that's a combat sport. Yeah. I know what it takes and what's at risk and what you're facing to get in that ring and how lonely it is. And again... These guys, usually I see it, you know, you know right away that you're, you're watching, you know, not boxing. Mm -hmm. You never would have known other than what I just pointed out because they were just boxing. They were just fighting. They were just striking. And at a good level, they, they used their jabs. Uh, they were setting up counters. Uh, when, when they went forward, they went forward the proper way. The fundamentals were there. These were two good, solid guys. Usman... Uh, he was he switched hit a little bit like Crawford, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Covington was the southpaw. Uh, Usman had again the dimension to go lefty or righty either side of the plate, and he did it well, like Crawford does. I'm not saying at that level, but you know he didn't really lose anything. Uh, they both used their jabs to set up, especially Usman was used. The one big advantage I think for Usman there was two things going on there. One was he had some physical asset advantages of height and length that 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 he understood how to use he had those physical but otherwise it was an even fight i mean mm -hmm. this was a really even great fight tremendous fight and the one other thing he was doing which was part of their game plan and credit to them was uzman they were going to the body and i always used to say when i would do the commentary at ringside with espn ken going to the body is like and you're a financial guy, so you you jump on, you understand this right away. Going to the body is like buying CDs 
and and <laughs> putting them in the bank <laughs> because it's going to get you interest. Mm -hmm. Not not right away, but later on down the road, a few rounds down the road, compounding interest. Com see the <laughs> financial guy. It's great to have a financial guy. You know, if you guys need your taxes done, anything <laughs> really, just call in. <laughs> Call in, we'll, uh, we'll put it up later on. <laughs> call in the number, call in Ken and you know, he'll do your taxes for you. Um, <laughs> maybe, but if we, if you get us up to, let's see, what number? Give me a number that we 100, have. 100,000. Get us up to 100,000 subscribers. subscribers. Get us up to 100,000 subscribers, all right? And Ken will do your taxes, <laughs> okay? We'll, we'll figure out who gets their tax done. And so what what I'm saying is, that he went to the body and you do get interest. You really do. And I think it paid off for him later on as, as the fight wore on. It paid off for him where he, he was able to slow down Covington in certain dimensions and, and catch up to him. It was a terrific fight. The thing I want to point out also is that you get these kind of fights more often than not. I'm not saying standing up all the time. Yeah. This fight really struck me that these guys just stood up. But you get these fights more often than not. It's not by accident when it comes to UFC because of Dana White. And I know he's a dictator. And I'm not saying that. In a, uh, it's kind of hard not to say it in a bad way when you say dictator. But I'm not saying it in a bad way because he's not killing people. He's not doing that. He, it's just that he's he's running his company the way he wants to run it. And he's able, he's got some special guys that stand out, you know, they get a little bit more favors like McGregor, you know. Yeah. But they, he, he insists that you're in a competitive fight. You're, you know, 80% 80, 80 of the time in boxing, it's not a, it's, it's an A against a B. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's too big a number, Ken. 80% mm. of the time, it's an A against a B. One guy's going to win, the other guy's probably not going to win. Uh, you know, we know it. 20% of the time in my sport, our sport, only 20% of the time is it that kind of competitive fight. Yeah. It's, 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 it's because of the nature of the game because you got a few power brokers and they all have their little pieces of land and they don't give a crap about the rest of the sport. Mm -hmm. And they're controlling, they're able to control their own little fiefdoms. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it. But, and it's a fact. What are you going to do? But in UFC, you, you can see what it looks like when it's done the right way. When, when, when somebody says, no, you got to fight somebody, you get good fights. And that's why their brand has grown enormously the way it has the UFC I mean there's a reason for it because they're putting good stuff on mm -hmm. they're putting a good product out there on a regular basis yep so and and I'd say one other thing the commentators I had to jump into this a little bit but the commentators sometimes there's too much shilling going on in the boxing I'm not going to point anybody specifically out but man there's too much shilling going on uh, when, because you got the A against the B and, and you know right away you could close your eyes and you know who the house fighter is because you hear the way the commentators are talking it's ridiculous mm -hmm. sometimes it's absurd it really like I want to say to you hey guys you got any pride I mean come on I mean and I'm wondering about the uh, you guys I feel bad what do you do you you don't notice or, or you got cotton you a lot of cotton but, uh, you put in your I, I mean sometimes it just gets too much but the commentator and sometimes the commentators in boxing are so terrific don't mm. get me wrong but I'm just saying sometimes boy and the commentators with the UFC there's no shilling and they were making good points yeah I mean, they, they, were, they were hitting, I mean, all commentators should make good points, but the truth is, you want to hear a little secret? They all don't. <laughs> Sometimes they all don't. Sometimes I wonder how they make uh, analysts up. You know, you, you, you're you going to watch the Super Bowl coming up, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're, gonna, you're not going to see a newspaper writer as a guy breaking down the offensive line blocking. Guarantee you. For everyone's sake, it better be Tony Romo. That guy yeah. is the no, best. No, He's yeah. miles but, but, ahead but of everyone. But I'm saying, you're not going to see, a, like in boxing, you're not going to yeah. see a guy who's never coached, never yeah. fought, never trained. A, uh, you're not going to see him telling you why a left's going to land or why the why uh, how a trap's going to be set. Oh, what, look for counter versus, you know, effective aggression. Yeah, No, they're not going to insult you and tell uh, I mean, in, in football, they know they can't do that. You're going to have a coach. You're going to have somebody who's done it, somebody who's been in that area. 
Somebody who should be breaking down the X's and O's. Not just, they have newspaper writers talking about what they're supposed to talk about on the sideline. You know, talking about how many fans are in the stands. <laughs> you know, I'm just yeah, saying, or whatever. Mean. Of course. But but they insult the crap out of me. That that uh, boxing, the, the so-called honchos, they, they, they don't care. They don't care that there's nobody holding a standard. There's nobody demanding a standard to the fans, to the fighters. The fighters deserve better than that. I digress. <laughs> I'm, I do that sometimes. But anyway, I appreciate the commentators that there's not shilling with the UFC, that I do see them making points that you would hope that somebody that knows their craft would be there to make, and they are. Mm-hmm. They are, whether it's Rogan or the other guy, they're, they're, making, they're, they're making proper points the, where they can add to the broadcast. Of, of what, you know, telling you what's going on. Mm-hmm. One of the fighters you just mentioned, Conor McGregor, was in action this past Saturday and uh, just a complete walkover beatdown of Donald Cerrone. I don't know if Cerrone threw a punch, but he definitely You know what it was like? The- you know what it was like? I always like to make comparisons, right? Yeah. Pull them out of the air. It was like Spinks Tyson, 90 seconds. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but this was 40. Well, I, I'm shocked because... Cowboy Cerrone is a tough guy. He's been in there with everyone, and he just got blown out of there so fast. But it speaks. My to son co- is a scout for the Raiders. Yeah, he's a good. He's good, my son. The Raiders are going to Vegas, and another year or two they'll be in the Super Bowl. I saw Mark Davis at oh, the fight. Yeah, mark it down, mark it down. They'll be in the Super Bowl, <laughs> and they're all doing a good job. Gruden, uh, all, all the, all the Mayock. Mayock, Mike Mayock, tremendous, tremendous. And my son's part of that team, so uh, they're doing good. Before the fight, my son made a point, being a, in the true essence of a scout. Doesn't have to be football. Mm-hmm. You're a scout, you're a scout. Mm-hmm. He said, Dad, there's one thing going against this cowboy. You know, I don't know, follow the UFC too much. He said, what's that, bud? He goes, he fights too much. He shot one. He fights a lot. He fights too much. And that's going to be where everyone was looking. He goes, Dad, it's like when you point out some. He goes, and, you know, you point it out in a different direction than where people are looking at it to be coming from. He said, McGregor, everyone's saying, oh, he's been inactive, you know, so they're saying Cowboys gonna, could win. A lot of people were saying that. And uh, the, uh, the the fight on the line for it in Vegas was very close, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of people were saying that, oh, McGregor's been inactive, he's made a lot of money, you know, he's not hungry no more, you know, whatever. Cowboys always fighting, this guy's a veteran. Yeah. He goes, but this is a time where it's going to work against him, where the other guy's going to be fresh, and this guy's going to be a little worn out. He also didn't make Cowboy cut weight, which people were saying was to uh, Cowboy's advantage because he's a naturally bigger guy. McGregor looked muscle bound, and they said to him, "Why are you doing it 170?" He goes, "Ah, I want him at his best. I can make him come down to 155." You know, McGregor is like the Mayweather of UFC. He could dictate any terms. He could fight him at any weight he he wanted, and dictate how many rounds probably too. But he said, "No, nah, let him come in at 170. No sense, no problem. If you think if he, if that's going to help him in 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 at the press conference, even Cerrone said, "I appreciate you not making me cut weight. I'm but, happy but, to but fight he, at 170." Just you mentioned a name, Mayweather. Mayweather, we all know he's a defensive genius. He's one of the great fighters of our time, all that undefeated. But what we should not miss, what he's also great at, is he's a great businessman. He's a great matchmaker. He's a great manager. He's a great guy at picking his spots. He sees something. Mm -hmm. I remember when he picked Canelo, everyone said, oh, he made a mistake. You know, back then. Oh, he made a mistake. Oh, and and he he won every round, except Mm -hmm. for that one criminal judge that had, (laughs) you know, again, can't get away from it, unfortunately. So, uh, again, it's, it's, McGregor saw something. To your point, you're saying, oh, he let him, he was being a nice guy. I, I would beg to, say maybe it was more than just being a nice guy he knew something he knew what we're talking about like Mayweather does he knew the the advantages the style Mm -hmm. the advantages and to his credit he was ready for it Mm -hmm. he was smart he knew that this guy is shop one this guy is a little shot this guy's very slow notoriously slow slow starter starter. he he, jumped him right at the beginning jumped on him and you know what uh, I gotta point something out you know he used his shoulder you're allowed to of course the bang bang Bang. Broke his nose. Broke his nose, right? But nobody teaches these UFCs, or in this case, Cowboy, 
it's there's a similarity in boxing where a guy try to help butt you. So you, as a trainer, you teach the guy to turn his head. Look, to turn his head so it's not available to be head butted. Mm-hmm. You get your head on the side. I, I was sh- almost as as much as it was. I give credit, and it was magnificent that part of the fight plan was to do that for McGregor. As much as you know, that stood out in a positive way. In a negative way, it also hit me that wait a minute. How could Cerrone not be taught to get his head? He he didn't keep it there for one hit, for two hits, for three. Mm. Like after one, turn your head. <laughs> you know, get your head out of there. Get your head out of there, bud. Yeah. You know, so I'm just saying, and I can't help it. That's the trainer in me that I'm watching. That and I'm saying, how is this guy leaving his head there? You know, he, he doesn't know what's coming next. So anyway, uh, I saw that. I saw that fight in, again in, in the different dimensions. I looked at it. Uh, yeah, McGregor had a f- great fight play. He knew what he was up against. He was faster. He he blitzed him. You know, it was the blitz creek. Mm-hmm. He, he he blitzed him. He knew he could blitz him. Uh, you know, he's uh, to his credit. You know, he's known as a good striker. But to his credit, he threw a good kick. You know, he threw a nice kick too. He did the thing with the shoulders, and then of course he jumped on him. Was all over. Uh, and and he, he pulled it off. But some of the other things that, again, that you don't get credit for because a lot of people say, well, what did you, what did you see? What did you get out of that? You know, really, it was a, on, it was a slaughter. You know, what did you get out of it? What did you see? You didn't see nothing from McGregor. Well, that's, again, where I give credit to the commentators where someone like Rogan pointed out right away. He said, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. You get credit, you get, there's other things you saw. Oh, what did I see? I just saw an onslaught. No. You saw a guy that handles pressure. Tremendous pressure, tremendous light. Mm. He handles the brightness of the light. He takes, that's part of his, we can't overlook that. That, That's part of his talent, part of his ability. That he, he takes that bright light the way flowers take in sun to grow, to glow. That's what he does. Yeah, no, and that's a good a observation. There's a, there's a talent to that. So Rogan right away said, no, no. He showed us how this is a special guy that handled. He handled the, no moments too big for him. Yeah, he's lost fights. Don't get me wrong. But there's a specialness to him that, that he can handle those moments. He thrives for those moments where a lot of guys shrink. He grows when those moments come. He, you know, and another thing a lot of people point out well he you know he's getting special attention he, uh, McGregor you know he lost his last fight yeah he did he might have lost his last two fights I didn't look at the record one of them was a boxing match it wasn't mm-hmm. a conventional fight but yeah he submitted in the last fight but he's one of those special guys like uh, Tyson and uh, Arturo Gatti comes to my mind that can it doesn't matter if they lose it doesn't matter they get to this place where it's a it's about what they bring. It's about mm-hmm. the excitement. It's a. It's about the theater of the unexpected. Mm-hmm. It's uh, and the expected that you're going to get excitement. That you you're going to get drama. It's about that. Very few people get that way. Where you lose, it doesn't hurt your career. Mm-hmm. McGregor is that guy. You know all those things are in play that I just mentioned. And I. We 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 can talk about his striking ability. We can talk about his game planning, which was all great. We could talk about him handling the pressure, but like I mentioned with Mayweather, one of his talents, you have to mention, and Muhammad Ali, and one other, all great promoters, and I'm going to mention another one, Evo Knievel. <laughs> yeah, you didn't expect that one. Uh, all, this is, McGregor has that talent. He's yeah. a great, great bringer of crowds. He's a genius. He's a genius as a promoter. I know some people say, oh, but Teddy, he got beat by, you know, the, the guy that he lost to his Nate last. Diaz and uh, Khabib. Uh, yeah, Khabib. Yeah, I, I, Khabib's I, a killer. He, I get it. I get it. But that is not the extent of his full dimension of the appreciation of what McGregor represents. Mm-hmm. He represents all these other things. Yeah. He's a great promoter. He gets people excited. I mean, to a level that Khabib, as great as he is, doesn't have that capacity. To, he he's again he's evil Knievel he's he's Floyd he's Muhammad he he's he's a great promoter 
He, he's Ringling Brothers and Bonham and Bailey. You know, he. he brings, you could see it from the first fight he's he had in the UFC. Everything. He was like, "I'm the best. I'm going to beat everyone," and, and he believes it and he does it. I mean, it pays even off. with the losses, you still believe he's the best. And and people, whether you believe he's the best or not, you believe there's something worth seeing. Yeah, for you, sure. Yeah, you, you believe I got to be there. His I, numbers I, I, dwarf everyone in terms of pay-per-views. He's crazy. He's the biggest draw. I mean, he, getting a fight against him is like winning a lottery for some of these guys. And I I want to see, if I could be matchmaker for a second, I'd like to see him with Masvidal. The, with who Masvidal, yeah. Mas, Masvidal, oh, hey, Masvidal, yeah. Yeah, Masvidal, I'd like to see him with him because there's something special about that guy too. Yeah. He's another guy who's an entertainer. He's, he's tremendous. He's Bruce Lee. Yeah. He, he, he walks to his own drama, just like to the beat of his own, just like McGregor, but there's so many facets to him. Mm-hmm. Like McGregor, he mm-hmm. does a lot of things. You know, this guy, he there's so many things he can do in that octagon, and he eats pressure up the way he, he, he craves pressure. Yeah. The same way as McGregor does. He craves a moment. He craves. He, he's made for that. I, I'd love... I'd love to see him or Usman. I'd like to see either Usman or Mazadov for the last, uh, as the next fight or the next two fights for McGregor. You yeah. know, they said Usman is uh, has an injury; he's out indefinitely. So I don't even think that's a possibility. I think we're going to get him with Masvidal or him against Nate Diaz. They're one and one against each other, which would also be an incredible. Yeah, of course fight. it would be. It would be, but there'd be a little extra sizzle, sparkle. To Masador. Oh, for sure. He just beat Nate Diaz, so that's definitely the, and, 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 uh, but, but the money charisma, fight. But his charisma, his charisma. Yeah. I know they both have, and they're both tough guys. I, I take none away from Diaz at all. Nothing but respect. But uh, Masador, you know, put it this way. If that fight happened, uh, the brains that are Dana White with the business and McGregor, the businessman that he is, just like Mayweather, uh, they, they, might be, they might be selling pay-per-view for the press conferences they, <laughs> no I'm, I'm serious those press conferences will be so wild yeah and so crazy that they might i don't know if i just gave them an idea but i'm telling <laughs> they might charge pay-per-view to watch the press conferences i mean that's how electric and crazy they could be definitely a good way to sell subscriptions to espn plus well listen this was a long one we had a lot to cover guys thanks for being with us Reminder, the episode today is brought to you by Teddy's Audio. Watch it in parts if it's too long. Watch it in parts. You can always watch it in parts. You know, heat up something in the microwave. <laughs> and, while see, and then go back and then and then go get uh, dessert. And, and watch it when you dessert afterwards. And then go take a run like Ken does. <laughs> go take a run. Worry about yourself. Take care of yourself. Be in shape. Really, we care about you guys. We want you to be in shape. We want you to be okay. So then go take a run. Come back. Take a shower. Then watch some more of it. And while you're running, listen to Teddy's listen to Teddy's audio book. You can get it on Apple or Audible.com. Atlas, From the Streets to the Ring, A Son's Journey to Become a Man. Please check it out. And guys, please take a minute to review the podcast. Leave us a uh, note on Apple iTunes, comments on YouTube, whatever you like. We appreciate all the support. Thanks for being with us. See you again soon. Oh,